Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, friends, when was the last time you heard someone say, I have some really good news to tell you. And then it really was good news, right? (laughs) Well, my husband, Ron, and I, uh, we have three sons. Chris is our youngest. Uh, He and his wife, Karen, just moved from Abu Dhabi, which is right next to Dubai, um, to Dayton, Ohio, just last fall. And my goodness, what a climate change for them. They're very happy to be in Dayton, Ohio. Matt is our uh, middle son, and he lives in Mansfield. And he has our grandson, Joshua, who is now a senior in high school. Wow. Uh, Brad is our oldest, and in January, he moved to Port Angeles, Washington. And by the way, I think the temperature there right now is about 60 degrees. So... Ron, you and I need to go to Port Angeles in a month or so, right? Well, not long ago, uh, one of our three sons, and I won't tell you which one, uh, called, got both of us on the phone, and simply said, I have some news to share with you. And I remember experiencing, you know, one of those slow motion moments where it seems like there's a million things going through your head all at once. And I distinctly remember focusing on that wording. I have some news. And and I was thinking, well, you know, if it was good news, it seems like he would have just said that, right? He would have said, I have some good news to share with you. Why why have some news? And, And I remember hoping, hoping that I would hear good news, but I was bracing myself for bad news. Anyone else ever do that? Yes, yes. As it turned out, thankfully, it really was good news. Uh, But why is it so hard to simply expect news to be good? And why do we spend so much time and, and mental energy in bracing ourselves for bad news? I notice myself doing that a whole lot more than I would like, and I bet I bet you do too. Our favorite daily news providers know this about us, right? They know us well. There's a lot of good news to share out there, but the bad news is what most often grabs our attention. Doom scrolling. Anybody heard that term before, doom scrolling? It's a relatively new term, and it describes how some of us obsessively scroll through social media reading the bad news, right? We often fall prey to the traps of clickbait headlines that are filled with um, sensationalism and spin. And they, they pop up everywhere because bad news still gets more attention, more clicks, and ultimately leads to more revenue for news publications and influencers. There's a term for that as well. It's called negativity bias. Negativity bias, it's our tendency to pay more attention to and actually give more weight to negative news. It's a fundamental human process that was really important for our ancestors, right? It was a life-saving mechanism for them. It helped them survive by alerting them to potential dangers and threats. However, 
For us today, this negativity bias can cause feelings of anxiety and depression and stress and hopelessness because there's so much news to choose from, right? Well, Google Assistant is Google's artificial intelligence powered voice assistant. It's kind of like Siri uh, or Alexa. And a few years ago, Google produced a commercial about how Google Assistant can help us focus on good news. Let's take a look. Since the dawn of humanity, there's been bad news. It served us pretty well. Spreading the word about threats helped a lot of humans survive a lot of terrible stuff, like famine, diseases, natural disasters, feuding tribes. Look out, bear! Today's news is an extension of these survival instincts. It helps keep us informed on modern day threats and uncover things that could be better in our world. But now we're exposed to more news than ever. And some days it could feel like the problems just keep coming. With solutions, nowhere to be found. Only hearing about the bad stuff can make our brains more vulnerable to fear, anxiety, and a negative outlook on the world. Yale scientists call this phenomenon the hope gap. It's when we're overly focused on a problem instead of the solution. It can make us stressed out, tune out, or even worse, shrink in our ability to problem solve. Okay, ready for some good news? Good news is happening every day. We just don't always hear about it, really. Right now, people are working to solve big problems in scalable ways. Curing diseases, creating equal opportunities, reinventing education, making neighborhoods safer. And some smart folks have surfaced heaps of data showing that the world is actually getting better in lots of ways. Hearing this kind of good news can do us all some good. It helps bridge the hope gap, inspiring us to be more proactive in dealing with the threats we face. Good news sparks dialogue, not just about what's wrong, but how it could be better. It's called Solutions Journalism, and there's a whole network of journalists dedicated to publishing it. Because research shows that hearing news focused on solutions can nudge us out of survival mode and into problem-solving mode, building more trust in each other and our communities. A lot of people come to Google looking for their news, so we wondered, what's the easiest way we could get more of this good stuff to more people? What if you could just ask for it? Like, hey Google, tell me something good and you get a daily dose of good news just by asking your Google Assistant. You'll hear news about real solutions to real problems, like the Detroit residents that are creating jobs by turning abandoned lots into sustainable bee farms, or the global program using video games to make city planning a more inclusive process. This is newsworthy stuff. It doesn't just make you feel good, it paints a more complete picture of where the world is headed and inspires people and policymakers to take part. Problems and threats and bad news aren't going anywhere. So, couldn't we all use a little something good? Hey Google, tell me something good. Well, in our scripture for today, Luke tells us that Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit following his time in the wilderness and news about Jesus spread throughout the whole countryside. And we remember he went to the synagogue he read the words of the prophet Isaiah, which is, the spirit of the Lord is on me, right? I mean, what an amazing moment that was when Jesus said those words. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus said to those who were gathered in that synagogue that day, today this scripture is fulfilled and you're hearing it. Wow, can you imagine the gasps? I especially love the way that Eugene Peterson interprets that last sentence that Jesus spoke. It's from the message version of the Bible. He interprets Jesus saying it this way. You've just heard scripture make history. It came true right here in this place. Let's pray and ask God's blessings on our response to his word today. Lord, would you bless our hearing and receiving of the Holy Scripture today? Would you proclaim your good news to us, in us, 
and through us, and with praise and thanks we say, Amen. Well, in the New Testament, the word we translate in English as good news is really a funny sounding word in ancient Greek. It's pronounced euangelion. And by the way, that's with a little bit of a Texas accent, okay? Euangelion. It was um, translated into Old English as Godspell, meaning good news, and eventually morphed into the English word we know today as gospel. Euangelion, gospel, good news. And this word, euangelion, was a very common word in Jesus' day because the Romans used it to proclaim their headlines of the day. For example, here's how people living in Jerusalem might receive the daily Roman newscast. First of all, the person who came to share the news was called the euangelistes, which is where where the word evangelist comes from. That's a bringer of good news. So the Roman newscaster would come out where the people were and announce the Roman news from something like a podium And the people would gather around in the street to hear the latest news, which was almost always something like this. Hear ye, hear ye, Caesar is Lord and has conquered yet another country. Caesar is Lord, he rules all things, and you have just heard one more sign of the power of Caesar. Now, How do you think most people took that news? Was it really good news? Could they they trust it? No, no. Rarely was it actually good news for people like you and me. And perhaps the news they heard felt like some of the news we hear today, something presented as good news, but as it is kind of peeled back, turns out that it's propaganda and strategy to control people. In our scripture reading today from Luke, Jesus proclaimed to his listeners that God had anointed him and sent him to proclaim good news, good news to the poor, freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. Rome was using the term good news to control people. But when good news is truly good news, it brings freedom and hope, not control. So as the Roman Empire proclaims Caesar as Lord of the world, Jesus comes and changes the whole news cycle. And he and his followers proclaim that someone else is Lord, and it isn't Caesar. The very first verse of the Gospel of Mark is another great and bold example of how Jesus changed the understanding of the news day. And it goes like this, Mark 1.1, the beginning of the good news, and by the way, yes, the Greek word used here is euangelion, with the Texas accent, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. In other words, here's the real headline news, the truth. Caesar is not Lord. Jesus is Lord. And this is good news for everyone, everywhere. When Jesus and his followers adopted that word, euangelion, to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God, they were saying something countercultural, shocking, and highly controversial for their time. You know, just a bit further into that first chapter of Mark at verse 15, Jesus makes it even more clear when he says, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe this good news. Well, the good news of Jesus' day is also the good news of our day. God The creator of the universe came in human form as Jesus to rescue us. Jesus has revealed the reign of God in both heaven and earth through his life, death, and resurrection from the dead. And with the Holy Spirit, he invites every one of us to join him in his resurrection life, declaring freedom 
from our oppression in darkness. The truth is, the bad news no longer reigns in our lives. So why do we keep living as if it does? I really appreciate the way United Methodist pastor and author James Bryan Smith describes two main parts of the gospel, the finality of the cross and the reality of the resurrection. He says the finality of the cross means that Jesus' death on the cross was sufficient for all people, for all sins, for all time. In Jesus, our sins are forgiven forever, past, present, and future. But some of us get stuck in this notion that God is still keeping track of our sins and that God's entire relationship with us is focused on our sin. And this can place us in a state of spiritual paralysis and and it's a false story about God. We can look at um, Colossians 2, 13 through 14, where the Apostle Paul writes, when you were spiritually dead because of your sins and because you were not free from the power of your sinful self, God made you alive with Christ and forgave all our sins. God canceled the debt which listed all the rules we failed to follow and God took away that record with its rules and nailed it to the cross. When we embrace the finality of the cross, we are set free to live into this new life of grace with Jesus. Which brings us to the second part of that good news, the reality of the resurrection. Christ is risen. He's alive. When we trust in Jesus, we are raised with him into the reality of the resurrection life. In Romans uh, 6, 6 through 11, the Apostle Paul explains this. He says, and by the way, I'm reading for the message version. Could it be any clearer? Our old way of life was nailed to the cross with Christ, a decisive end to that sin-miserable life, no longer captive to sin's demands. What we believe is this, if we get included in Christ's sin-conquering death, we also get included in his life-saving resurrection. We know that when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was a signal of the end of death as the end. Never again will death have the last word. When Jesus died, he took sin down with him, but alive he brings God down to us. From now on, think of it this way. Sin speaks a dead language that means nothing to you. God speaks your mother tongue and you hang on every word. You are dead to sin and alive to God. That's what Jesus did. The reality of the resurrection is that the resurrection power of Jesus Christ is alive in us, the body of Christ in the world. We no longer have to fight the darkness on our own because let's face it, without Jesus, sin will always win. But when we rely on the reality of the resurrection, the power of Jesus Christ in us, we can have assurance that Jesus has forever won that battle for us. And that's good news. The reality of the resurrection means that salvation is not merely about getting us into heaven when we die. It's so much more. Salvation is about getting heaven into us here and now. And as people who trust in the finality of the cross and the reality of the resurrection, we have good news to claim and proclaim, right? Good news that flows from the very nature of God. We are people led by the Spirit to love God and share our good news story. We have good news to share with our world. And it's not about control. It's about freedom and life in a world reigned by God's grace. And this, this is the biggest headline 
of any day. So, why do we still get so hung up on bad news? And why are so many people we care about being held captive by bad news? How can we do a better job of sharing our good news story with people who find themselves in that hope gap that the Google commercial spoke about, right? That place where we get overly focused on the problem instead of on the one who is the solution. I believe the Holy Spirit is working in you and me right now, shaping us to reveal God's good news, the the truth that Jesus is Lord and that God reigns right here and now. And in Isaiah 52, seven, we remember these words, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Well, that's you. That's you, that's me, that's us together. Good news flows from the very nature of God. And the way we reveal God's good news is really unique to the way the Holy Spirit's gifted in us, right? It might be that we share the good news in the way that we listen to people, we look into their eyes, we sit with empathy and hear their stories. Or it might be through the work of our hands and the way we go out to bless others through the way we serve, through the way we make sure people feel welcomed and make sure people have food and clothing and a safe place to call home. Or, you know, our good news story might be in the way that we, you know, kind of spend time leading a group of others, maybe leading a group of adults, maybe mentoring children and students. There'll be a lot of that mentoring going on this week. I promise you, you have a good news story to share and it is unique to your good news story with God. So I wanna encourage you uh, in the coming week to ask yourself this very simple question. What does the Holy Spirit want to do in and through me to reveal God's good news? What does the Holy Spirit want to do in and through me to reveal God's good news? It is good news that we no longer have to be held hostage by bad news. God sent Jesus to change the headlines for all of us.